Buddhist path is a middle way that avoids two extremes. The extreme of indulgence and sensual pleasure on the one hand, and the extreme of self-torture on the other. Now notice he doesn't say it lies halfway between those two. It avoids those two. It avoids them by using pleasure and using pain. Not by having kind of half pleasure and half pain. It takes the pleasure of concentration and uses that as part of the path. And as for pain, it learns to use pain, to use suffering as the object of contemplation. So we can learn how to free our mind from being driven around by pain all the time. This applies to the heavy pains of illness, aging, death, and also the more subtle ones that drive the mind into addictions. The little bit of anger and the little bit of tiredness or the little bit of dis-ease that can make the mind run for something that it knows isn't all that skillful, but will temporarily assuage the problem. At least so it thinks. So it's important that we learn how to overcome our attachment to both sensual pleasure and to pain, or our, our fear of the pain, or the extent to which we're being driven around by these things. So this is what the middle way offers, is something that learns how to use these things. We're in charge of the pleasures, we're in charge of the pains, rather than being driven around by them. You see this in the four steps of breath meditation that the Buddha taught that are related to feelings. You breathe in and out sensitive to rapture, breathe in and out sensitive to pleasure. Breathe in and out sensitive to mental fabrication, which is composed of perceptions and feelings. And then you breathe in and out calming mental fabrication. Now these four steps can apply both to developing the pleasure of of concentration, and to learning how to get in a position where you can start looking into the problem of pain. First with the concentration, you try to breathe in a way that allows the, the body to feel full of breath energy. Now this doesn't mean filling your lungs with air. It's more a matter of how you relate to the energy flowing through the nerves and not squeezing it off. The word rapture may be too intense for what this is experienced by some people. Some people do experience it, though, as intense rapture. For other people, it's just a good sense of fullness, where the energy channels in the body are opened up, and there's a feeling of flow. When you breathe in, breathe out, there's no sense of squeezing any of the parts of the body. So you might think of that. Think of all the blood vessels in the body relaxing. And as you breathe out, you're not squeezing anything out. There's a subconscious tendency as we breathe out to try to squeeze the energy out as we're squeezing the air out. Don't, don't squeeze. If the air can come out on its own, you don't have to squeeze at all. Start with the hands. Think of relaxing all the muscles around the fingers and the, and the palms of the hands, going up the wrists, going up the arms. And keeping them relaxed all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out, and then start down with the toes. Work your way up through the feet, the ankles, the legs, up the spine. Everywhere your attention is, think of things being full. There's no sense of squeezing as you breathe out. The breath energy comes in, it feels full, and it's able to feel full all the way out. And the sense of fullness becomes more constant through the in-breath and through the out-breath. You get a sense of refreshment, which is another translation of the word bitti. Now, some people find this actually unpleasant. I know a woman, woman who almost drowned twice in her life. And the sense of fullness reminded her of the sense of fullness that comes right before drowning, and it scared her. So there's a sense of dis-ease around this energy flow. People don't feel quite right about it in some cases. Other people go right for it. But if you have, find you have trouble with it, remind yourself you're not drowning. You've got air all around you. And 
Learn how to relax into it. This allows you to breathe in and out with a sense of pleasure as well. Now, if you have trouble maintaining that sense of ease and pleasure, you might want to look into the perceptions that you're holding. This gets into that third step, being sensitive to mental fabrication. Here, choose to think of the breath. You think of it coming in from outside, but coming in from all directions, as if your body were a large sponge. With all the channels and all the holes were all connected. So as you breathe in, the energy comes in through all the pores. That gives a much more expansive sense of the breath. Or you can remind yourself that the breath energy actually starts inside. It doesn't come from outside. It starts within. The air comes from the outside, but the energy that allows the air in starts at different spots in the body. And John Lee talks about the resting spots of the breath. A good one to begin with is the one right above the navel. Another good one is the one right at the tip of the sternum, the breastbone. Hold in mind the perception that as you breathe in, energy is coming from there, spreading so that the air can come in and it goes out. And you begin to sense that there is an energy in the body that stays there, regardless of whether the in and out breath is coming in or out. But this energy is always there. And that perception of the breath can allow the mind to settle down. This is the fourth step, calming mental fabrication. In other words, finding the perceptions and the feelings that allow the mind to settle down. After all, the sense of rapture may get a little bit strong, so you let that go. Think of tuning into a more refined level of pleasure. And this, the need for the in and out breath gets less because the breath energy is filling the body. Remind yourself you don't have to keep pumping things in. If the body doesn't want to breathe, you don't have to force it. The breath may get very, very gentle, sometimes so gentle that it seems to stop. Well, if you need to breathe, the body will breathe. Don't worry. You've got all the breath energy you need. As you can relax into this sense of well-being, you find that it really is nourishing, and it gives you a place to look at your other attachments. You begin to see a lot of them don't really measure up. There, Here's a sense of pleasure that can come. And as you get better and better at it, you can tune into it more quickly. This level of energy, the calm breath energy, is always there in the body. It's like those deep currents in the bottom of the ocean. There are the winds and storms across the surface of the ocean. But there are deeper currents that are not affected by those winds and storms at all. As long as you know it's there, you can tune in. And then you have something to tune into when there's a little bit of tiredness, a little bit of exasperation, a little bit of whatever that might want to make you want to go for something that you know is not all that good for you. So that's using those four steps to get a sense of well-being that allows you to fend off a lot of things that would otherwise be harmful for the mind. That's using the pleasure. In this case, it's not sensual pleasure. It's what the Buddha calls the pleasure of form, your sense of the body as you feel it from within, what in English we call proprioception. And you learn you can tune into this and make the most of it. This is an application of mindfulness. Remember, mindfulness doesn't mean just accepting things as they are. It means remembering that there are ways to develop good things, both in the body and the mind. So you want to give rise to them, you remember it. Give rise to them, you remember, maintain them. So instead of just watching them arise and pass away, you make them arise and you prevent them from passing away. This gives you a good, solid foundation inside. Gives you your food inside. Healthy food for the mind. Now, the same four steps can also be used for dealing with pains that are more intense than just the brief irritation that can drive you to an addiction. In this case, you again, you start out with those 
two steps of learning how to breathe in a way that gives rise to rapture, gives rise to pleasure. When there's pain in the body, this may seem hard. But you have to remember when the pains connect up in the body. One, you may be mistaking the connections of the pains for your whole sense of the body. So remind yourself there's a lot more of your body around those patterns of tension, the patterns of pain. Think of it like being a map. Map to the roads, say, of California. When you look at the map, you pay all attention to the roads, the lines. We tend to not pay attention to the white spaces in between, but they're there. And so you may be connecting up pains to the body, because the mind does have this tendency to connect these things up. After all, it's connecting up lines of tension that allow us to move the body around. But right now you don't need those. You can be perfectly still. Think of cutting through the patterns of tension, focusing on the areas between the lines. That's where you can breathe in a way that gives rise to a sense of fullness and gives rise to a sense of pleasure. And as you're doing this, you're beginning to see the, the power that perception has by shifting your perception from the lines to the spaces in between. You've changed your relationship to the body. You've changed your sense of what's there. So those are the first two steps you used to deal with pain, giving yourself a foundation first. And then you start looking into the pain and realize the problem is not so much the pain, it's the perceptions you have around the pain. So you want to see what those are. And a good way to do that is to question them. And John Mahabhu has a lot of good questions to ask. Some of them seem strange, but then again, our notions about how we relate to pain can be strange. And if you don't ask a strange question, you don't get the dig out the strange things that are there. No. Is the pain the same thing as the body? And part of you will say, well, no, but something inside you says that's how it feels. But then what are body sensations as opposed to pain sensations? Body sensations are the four, the four properties, warmth, coolness, energy, solidity. And pain is none of those. It's something else. It seems to be in the same place, but it's not in a different frequency. So can you make a perception where the pain is one thing, the body is something else, your awareness is something else? And if you find that that's, that's helpful, okay, you've moved on to the fourth step. You've calmed mental fabrication. In other words, you've found a perception that helps take some of the burden of the pain off the mind. Is the pain something solid? Is it steady or does it move around? As you begin to look at it and see where there's steadiness to the pain, you begin to realize that it, you, you may have the perception that it's a solid block, but the actual sensations of pain are something else. And they come and go in instances. And the next question is, is when they're coming, do they come at you? You can change that perception. Think of them going away. It's like you're sitting in the, the caboose of a train, looking out the, behind you as the train is moving east, you're facing west. Anything that comes into your range of vision on either side of the track is going away from you as soon as you see it. So think of that with the moments of pain. They're going away, going away, going away. As soon as you know them, they're going away. That puts you in a better position with regard to the pain. Here again, you've moved on to that fourth step of calming mental fabrication. And you begin to see how much the problem of pain is related not to the actual sensation, but to the perceptions, the labels and ideas that you have around it. And if you can change those labels, you change the relationship. Sometimes you find that Simply by holding an unskillful perception, you've maintained a pain much longer than it would have otherwise. Because we do have this tendency, when a pain comes, we tense up around it and hoping that it will prevent it from spreading. And sometimes the original problem that caused the pain is gone, but we're still tensing up around it, maintaining a sense of pain. So there are times that when you change the perception, the pain will go away. 
Other times it doesn't go away, but the mind has a sense of being separate from the pain. It's not afflicted by the pain. And that enables you to be in a position where you don't feel driven to run away from the pain or driven to do the unskillful things we tend to do under the force of pain. So this, this can be a very liberating analysis. So these are how we use pleasure and use pain in order to free the mind. Because that's another way in which the middle way avoids sensual pleasure and avoids self-tormenting. Because all too often we take sensual pleasure as a goal. And then we see that sensual pleasure, if we indulge too much and it's bad for us, then we run to the other opposite, opposite end of the spectrum. Try to starve ourselves, torture ourselves. And we just go back and forth. But the middle way goes beyond that. Instead of lying in a continuum, it lies outside of the continuum that would stretch between these two things. And it goes to freedom. So a mind that's not driven by pleasure, not driven by pain, that knows how to use them and how to let them go. You get to the point is where, where John Lee says, think of the words pleasure and pain as things that people just say in jest. You want the mind to be in a position where it can see them simply as that, not, not serious issues anymore. Childish concerns that used to drive you, that, but now you've outgrown. And you found the freedom that comes with growing up. 